Grab a Bible and turn open to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11. So there's an old saying that holds pretty true most of the time. That actions speak louder than words. Right? Right? Most of the time, actions speak louder than words. And when your actions speak louder than your words in the sense that you've said something and then done the opposite, we have a word for that. It's called a hypocrite. Right? Hypocrisy. If you say one thing and then do the opposite of the thing that you say, that is playing the hypocrite. There was this guy that I knew, and uh, he was just crying the blues to me often about how he needed a job. And I knew his wife more than I knew him, and his wife was crying to me how much he needed a job. And in my naive state, I had just helped to plant the church, and it was relatively early on, and and I thought, oh, I could help here. And so I ran around town, and I was driving around everywhere I went, as I'm out with with my business or whatever else, everywhere that I go, I start looking for places that are hiring. And I write down this list of like 10 or 11 or 12 within just a couple of days. And so even more naive, I typed it (laughs) because I like to look professional. And so I have this typed list of names of companies, the addresses of the company, the phone number of who to contact, and the rate of pay that they're offering. I had nice, neat little columns. And I took it to this guy's house and I knocked on the door. And he answered the door, and when he realized why I was there, he didn't even pull the door shut behind him. He didn't invite me, and he stood there with the door open. And I handed him the list, and I said, I said, you said you've been looking for a job, and, and so I found at least 10 places within just a few miles of your home that you, could, that you could work. And with his finger, he started to make X's on the paper, and he said, well, I can't work there because uh, that's retail, and I, I, I don't do well in retail. And I can't work there because that's a factory. And I don't do good in factory jobs. I'm, more of, I'm, I'm a more creative person than that. And then he went to the next one and he crossed it off. And he said, no, I, I can't do that one. He said, that's, that's too labor intensive. And I've got a bad shoulder and I've got a bad back. And he crosses off the next one and said, they want me to work night shifts. I've already looked there before. And he crosses off the next one. I promise you he crossed off every one on my list and turned the paper around and handed it back to me. Do you think that guy really wants a job? No. His actions are saying something different than what his words were saying. When he was calling me on the phone and when he's trying to explain his, his, his financial woes and when he wanted help from the church, well then certainly, you know, he wanted a job. But when laid back on him and said, here are things that you could do right around you, he crossed them all off and said, I don't, I don't want anything to do with that. That's a hypocrite. Today we're going to see as even one of the apostles played the part of hypocrite at one point. And I don't say that, before I go any further with that statement, I don't say that to to demonize or to, to belittle one of the apostles in any way. But don't forget, as we've said a million times before, that the apostles are men, just like we are men and women. And they fell short, just like we do. And we are always supposed to forgive and move on. You are Christians. And if you don't want other people judging you, here's a, por- here's a portion I didn't get to from our Sunday school lesson today, but if you don't want other people judging you, you might be quicker to forgive. All right, look with me. This is Galatians 2 and verse 11. And let's read the story. This is an account from Paul of something that happened with Peter. So it's in Galatians 2 and verse 11. Do you have it? Amen. Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face. Because he was to be to blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew, separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with, this, with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that, there were not, that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you being a Jew... Live in the manner of the Gentiles and not as the Jews? Why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? 
We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. And through the law, excuse me, verse 19, for through the law, one more time, I'm going to get it right, verse 19, for I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Let's go to the Lord in prayer about his word. Heavenly Father, who are we that you are mindful of us? What is man? And yet you allow us to come into your throne room and to petition you directly by the blood of your son, Jesus. So for just a moment, Lord, we want to sit in all of you and say thank you for even hearing us to begin with. And even more than just hearing, Father, thank you that you are a good father who cares about us and who knows us. And Father, even right now that you would incline your ear toward us and this prayer, we are in awe of you. And we ask you, Lord, that you would please reveal to our hearts what your word has for us. Lord, I feel as though we might be reading a passage that gets brushed over. But there's so much depth here, Lord, and we trust that your Holy Spirit inspired holy men from you to write this. And so, God, we know, we trust, we have faith and believe that you have a purpose for us to hear this even today. And we pray that your spirit would penetrate our hearts and reveal to us what that is. Father, forgive us where we've fallen short, where we've transgressed against you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Let us understand your word. We lack understanding, Lord, but we ask you and we know that you give liberally and upbraideth not if we ask. So we ask you. Give us wisdom about your word and help us to understand it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, look with me. Verse 11. Now when Peter had come to, you say it, it's in your Bible. When Peter had come to what? Antioch. Antioch. That's different than last week. Last week the setting was what? Paul had went to where? Starts with a J, ends with a Jerusalem. Let's all say it together now. Last week Paul went to? Jerusalem. Remember that was the setting. That was the Jerusalem council. So there's these churches in Galatia, right? Churches, plural. Churches in Galatia. And Paul went and planted those churches. He started them. When we say, when the, when, when the church world says somebody planted a church, they mean he started the church in that area. Well, Galatia is, Galatians or Galatia, that was a, an area. We know it as Asia Minor or modern day Turkey. There were multiple churches in Asia Minor, and Paul had planted them. Well, every time Paul would move from one church to another church, he had these people that were following him. They were called the Judaizers. We've talked about these guys, right? The Judaizers want Paul to teach the people of his churches that they should be what? Circumcised. Why do they need to be circumcised? In the minds of the Judaizers, they should be circumcised so that they can be saved. Well, Paul refuted that. And he took these guys and he took that idea and he took it back to Jerusalem and he went to the pillars. I put that in quotations because that's how Paul talked about them last week. He said, whether they were something or not, that's not for me to judge. God's not a respecter of persons. But the, what seemed like the pillars of the church, right? The pillars, James and John and Peter. We took it to them in Jerusalem and guess what? They agreed with me. Paul telling the churches of Galatia, they've agreed with me. The church of Jerusalem, the pillars of the church agreed. There is nothing else. It is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And when you believe in that, you are saved. Did everybody hear that in the room? That's the whole point of this. Every time we get in the Bible, what do we find? It's Jesus Christ and Him crucified. It's always that. And Paul is trying to tell the churches of Galatia, even though now he's left, this is years in the future, the Galatian churches are still there, but those Judaizers are still messing with them. 
And the Judaizers are trying to get the church now that Paul is gone. They're trying to say Paul had it really close, but he didn't get it all the way. You still need to be circumcised. You still need to follow the calendar. You still need to go to the feast. You've got to be a Jew to be a Christian. And Paul is writing them a letter and saying, no, you do not have to be a Jew to be a Christian. Everybody got the point, right? That's where we are in Galatians. And so now Paul is giving another example of that. And he says, do you remember, verse 1, right now when Peter had come, do you remember this church of Galatia? When Peter had come, churches of Galatia, I should say, when Peter had come to Antioch and I withstood him to his face. Now, can you imagine that for just a moment before we go any further? Do you remember in Acts that Peter was walking by people and his shadow was casting on them and they were being healed? I mean, does anybody remember it was Peter who walked up on the guy that was asking for money and Peter said, silver and gold, I have none, but what I have I give to you freely. And he said that you could be forgiven and to take up, to rise up and walk. And the guy did. Come on, guys. Look, look at this. This is Peter. This is Peter. Same Peter that's been doing miracles. Same Peter that, planted, that was planting churches in Jerusalem. That Peter. And Paul says, I stood up to him. Woo, now Peter said, when, now when Peter had come to Antioch, I was stood him to the face because he was to blame. Why was he to blame? Verse 12. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew himself. He separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. You see what just happened? You see what just happened? Peter was there with... Not, first time Paul went to Peter, Jerusalem. Now Peter comes to Paul in Antioch. That was Paul's home church. And there in Antioch, Peter was doing something that was unheard of for the Jews. See, they would have these things called love feast. And the love feast, you can read about those in, in 1 Corinthians. The love feast was a, a meal. It was a potluck. We would know it as a potluck. We get together and we have fellowship meals and we have a potluck meal. We're Baptists. We do that all the time. That's what we're going to do this afternoon. We come together and we eat something, right? That's because that's, that's, the, that's the best way to spend time together is eating. <laughs> and so that's what they did. They would come together and they would eat. But at the end of their meal, what would they do? They would do communion, the Lord's Supper. They would have this meal together, and at the end of the meal, they would, they would end the meal by saying that they were going to have a, a, a Lord's Supper together. They were going to break the bread, and they were going to take the wine in remembrance of Christ until he comes. And so at this, at this meal, here's what would happen. If you had something against each other, if I and Tom had something against each other, if we were mad at each other, we would come to the meal and we would work with each other. We would work it out before we would go have the Lord's Supper. That was the point of what they were trying to do. They would come together and they would work their differences out and then they would take the Lord's Supper together, remembering that they're brothers and sisters in the Lord. There was, it didn't seem like a problem for Peter before because Peter was where? Remember Paul last week, he went to where? It starts with a J. Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, they were flooded with a whole bunch of Jews. So Peter had been preaching that you didn't have to do anything else to be, to be a Christian. You just have to have faith in Christ. But for the most part, the people that he was dealing with were Jews. And the people in his church were Jews. And so holding to old Jewish traditions at times wasn't really a problem. But now the scene has changed and Peter has made his way to Antioch. And in Antioch, that's a Gentile world. And there's Jews and Gentiles in the same church. Can you imagine when Peter got there for the first time? And he went down for the love feast. He went down for the fellowship meal. And there's some guys with the things on their head. And there's some guys with the things on their forehead or on the back of their hands, the phylacteries. And can you imagine when, the, when Peter walked in and there's some guys who are recognizably Jewish. And there's other guys sitting at the same table who are not. We'll, get, we'll read it in a little bit, but suffice it to say for the moment, according to Jewish law, they were not allowed to eat with Gentiles. To follow, this is not just, this is not just a petty like, oh, uh, he doesn't want to eat with them because he doesn't like them, or this is some sort of petty like, I don't like that group of people. No, no, no. You have to understand from Peter's perspective, from the Jewish perspective, this was a rule. This was a law. It is against the law for a Jewish guy to eat with a Gentile. He's not supposed to do this. Can you imagine when he walks down 
to the love feast. And there's Paul standing beside him. And Paul reaches up and puts his hand on his shoulder and says, Isn't it beautiful? All of God's people sitting together. Do you, can you imagine how timid Peter must have been the first time he went and sat down at the table with other Gentiles? I'm sure you're getting the picture. You can imagine he feels like he is doing wrong. He's going to go and sit down at this table. I'm sure he was timid as he sat down at the table. Can you imagine even more when he had to ask the, the Gentile beside him to pass the lentils? <laughs> uh, now he not only sat beside him, but the guy touched his food. I mean, this is like, this is unclean all the way around. But he's already dealt with that. We'll get there from Acts 10 in a moment. I promise we'll get there. But for just a moment, just picture that Peter had to probably work up to this a little bit. He'd been sitting down and eating with the Gentiles. Not about the first time he was timid, but by the second, third, fourth time, he probably was real used to it. He probably got to the point it, it felt good. It was nice to sit beside brothers and sisters in the Lord and eat with them. But then, I don't know how long went by, a few days, maybe a week, we don't know. But what we see is this, verse 2, for before, that was before. Before certain men came, uh, came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew himself and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. You get in the picture? Here's Peter who'd been sitting with the Gentiles. But James, remember one of those pillars? James had sent some other Jewish guys to Antioch where Peter was. And when the other Jewish guys got there, Peter got nervous. And he didn't want them to see him eating with Gentiles. So when it came time for the meal, he wasn't really sure what to do, but Peter withdraws himself. He goes and sits at the other end of the table, and he starts calling all the Jews to come and sit with him. So much so that we even read that Barnabas even played the hypocrite with him. He even got Barnabas. That was Paul's partner for a while. He even got Barnabas to come sit with the Jews and separate from the Gentiles. You're getting the picture, right? When I was, uh, I was homeschooled from second grade until eighth grade when my mom had to go back to work. And then ninth grade, first day of high school in ninth grade, we, we didn't have assigned seating at lunch. There was these long gray tables with these little circle uh, stools connected to them. And, and you had to sit at this long table and there was a bunch of kids there. And so I went in with my lunch and I went to the first table. There was a first open. I went to sit down and some girl put her hand on the seat and she said, saved. And so I walked around to another empty spot and I tried to sit down and some guy took his backpack and stuck it up. I'm not making this up. He said, saved. At this point, I'm visibly angry and I tried to go to another seat and it's like a couple of seats away from everybody and I'm promising you somebody goes, oh, that's saved. I'm saving that for somebody. I was so angry that I went outside. This was when Oldham County had a breezeway. If any of you went to Oldham County at that time, there was a breezeway to separate from the high school to the cafeteria. I went out to the breezeway and there was a concrete ledge and I sat down on the concrete ledge and I got one bite of my sandwich and who comes down the way but Miss Hart? Vice principal. Right, you remember the name. You're like, oh. <laughs> Miss Hart comes down and she says, young man, what are you doing? And I said, I'm trying to eat my lunch. And I was visibly upset, and she said, well, you can try to eat your lunch in there or go back to your class, but you're not sitting out here. So I tried to protest, and I said, there's no seats in there. And I promise you this is what happened. She leaned over, and she looked in the door, and she went, there's plenty of seats in there. Go in there, go back to class. So I stood up out of anger, and I threw my lunch away, and I marched myself back to class. Can you imagine what the Gentiles felt like when... Peter, who'd been eating with them. Can you imagine the old lady? Let's, let's put a real perspective. Here comes an old lady with a pot of lentils. Hey, Peter. And Peter goes, uh, not here. Could you sit at the other end? Uh, okay. And she goes and puts her pot at the other end. Can you imagine when the guy that Peter had been trying to disciple made his way to the table and Peter said, uh, actually, uh, that's for the Jewish guys. We're going to let the Jews sit over here today. Do you see what, do you see what he's doing, this, the, the picture that he's painting? The picture that he's painting is that this Jewish law, this Jewish rule, you can't eat with these guys. They're Gentiles. And now he's telling the Gentiles, he's saying, you, you obey it too. You go over there. Don't sit with us. We're going to sit here and you guys sit over there. This is the picture that he's, that he's painted. And look at, what, look at what Paul says in verse 14. But when I, that's Paul, the guy writing, but when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, you got the picture? In front of everybody. Can you imagine how excited everybody was in Antioch when Peter was coming? 
Peter's going to be here. I'm sure they were all pretty shocked when Paul, in front of all of them, says, Peter, I got a question for you. What's his question? You ready? If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of the Gentiles and not as a Jew, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? Do you see how he flipped that on him? First he called him out and said, you've been living like a Gentile, you've been eating with them. In front of his Jewish buddies, by the way. <laughs> that was bold. In front of everybody, Paul says, why do you who've been living like a Jew, or who've been living like a Gentile, though you're a Jew, why do you want these Gentiles to act like Jews and to not mingle? Gentiles didn't care. You understand that, right? Gentiles didn't care. They'd eat with anybody. It didn't matter. But the Jews had the rule. It was a Jewish law. They couldn't eat with the Gentiles. And he says, why do you want them to obey that? Why are you shooing them away and telling them to go somewhere else? Why do you not want them to eat with you? So look at what he goes on to say. We're going to pick this apart and then we'll put it all back together and make some real practical applications. So look, I'm in verse, uh, in verse 15 now. He said before them all, uh, if you being a Jew live in the manner of the Gentiles and not, as a Jew, and, and not as a Jew, why do you compel the Gentiles to live as Jews? Verse 15, we are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. Knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Paul, in front of everybody, says to Peter that even us, even us, what did we have to do? When he's saying we, who's he talking about? He's talking to Peter, and he's saying we, even we. Who's he talking about? Jews, right? Right? Do you, do you see it again? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. He's not being insulting to Gentiles there. He's referencing the way that Jews would have seen it. Jews would have seen it that these are Gentiles and they're sinners. But we're Jews. We're God's chosen people. So he says, if we who are Jews, not sinners like the Gentiles, if we what? If we have to be justified by faith in Jesus Christ, just like they have to be justified by faith in Jesus Christ, what difference is there between us when it comes to Christ? I want you all to hear me, and you need to hear this very well. Jesus Christ is the Son of God who came to this earth and died for you and died for me. It's the same prescription for the same problem no matter how we swing it. As a matter of fact, I'll prove it. Read a little further. It almost seemed like it didn't make sense the first time you read it, but if you really look at it, it makes perfect sense. Look at verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. For by works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. I'll come back to that, but look at verse 15, 17. But if while we, who's the we? Jews. If while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Do you understand what he just did? He looked at Peter and said, you, Peter, you've got to be saved just the same way I've got to be saved, which is the same way that the Gentiles have to be saved. We all have to be saved the exact same way. And what is that way? By faith in Jesus Christ. So we just got labeled with the sinners. Does that make Christ a minister of sin? We're, we're Jews. We're God's chosen people. Is Christ a minister of sin? Of course he answers that. Certainly not. Christ is not a minister of sin. That is not Paul saying that Christ is a minister of sin. What he's pointing out is that we are no better than they. And now I need to talk to the Christians for a moment. You do realize that we're no better than they. The people that are outside of church today, the people that are outside of the kingdom of God, the people that do not know Jesus, you are just as much of a sinner as they are. The only difference between you and them, the only difference between me and them is one thing. I have been saved by the blood of Jesus from my sin and they still live in theirs. The only reason that I'm going to heaven, the only reason that I have salvation, the only reason I have the Holy Spirit, the only reason that God has put it on me to worship Him is because Jesus Christ died for me and I have my faith in Him. But if you want to look at, if you want to level the playing field, here it comes real level. We're all sinners. 
The Gentiles were sinners. The Jews are sinners. Church people are sinners. Non-church people are sinners. Everyone is sinful. The Bible says that if you say you have no sin, you are a liar and the truth is not in you. Yeah? The Bible says that there is none that is good, no, not one. The Bible says that your righteousness is as filthy rags compared to God. There is not one person who is better than another, and I don't think that we suffer in our time. We don't really suffer from too many people feeling like they're so righteous by their birth that they don't, that they don't need salvation. But I would claim something, and I want you to really hear this. It's real easy for church people to start to think that we're more righteous than everybody else. It's real easy for church people to start getting a holier-than-thou attitude with people that are outside the walls of the church. But if you'd really look at your own life, what we'd find is just what Jesus said. you got a whole big log in your own eye, and you're trying to pull out splinters in other people's. Paul said, you, Peter, Peter, you're a sinner, and I'm a sinner. And if we are justified by, by Christ, if we're, found, if we're found as sinners, does that make Christ a minister of sin? No, Christ is not a minister of sin. He is a minister to sinners. Christ is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so Jesus gave his life, died on a cross, and rose again that you could have a new life in him. That was for the Gentiles, that was for the Jews, that was for 2019, that was for 2,000 years ago. By the way, I'm not even going to pass the plate around for this. I'll just give you a little extra one too. You ready for this? You do realize that's how people in the Old Testament were saved too. I get that question every year. Somebody comes to me and they say, okay, if we believe in Jesus for our salvation, how did people in the Old Testament who didn't know anything about Jesus believe for salvation? And I say the same answer. They, we believe in a Christ that came, they believed in a Christ that was coming, but we still believe in the same Christ. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And there is one way of salvation. Jesus said, I am the way. I'm not the new way. I'm not, a, I'm not a new way. He said, I am the way. The way that has always been definitive. I am the way, the truth, and the life. It is Christ and Him crucified has always been. And if you want salvation, you have to believe in Him. It's as simple as that. Now, look at this, though. Come back with, to me to, come back with me to verse 17. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners, is Christ, there, Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Paul talking, keep, keep it in context, Paul speaking, and he says, if I try to build back up the thing that we already destroyed, the thing that we already tore down, we're transgressing. Turn with me in your Bibles. Turn back to, to Acts chapter 10. I won't read the whole story because it's too long and I've already got all this other story stuff going on so I don't want to lose track. But, but there, what Paul is referencing here is what happened with Peter already. And with Paul, by the way. Paul went through his own scenario of this. And I'm not going to go into all that, but, but understand that Paul and Peter and all the Jews had to go through this. They had to realize that they had to humble themselves before a holy God and say, we are not anything special. We need Christ we need Jesus and we need to believe in him if we want to be saved. Paul had his own way to go through this, but he said this. He said, if I try to, if I try to build back up that thing that I tore down, I'm transgressing. Peter had a time when he had to tear this down. Are you ready for this? There's this guy named Cornelius. Cornelius, is a, he's in Acts chapter 10, and he's a Gentile, but he's a righteous man. The Bible said he was righteous. He wanted to believe in God, but he, wasn't, he didn't know anything about Jesus yet. And God sends an angel to Cornelius and gives him a message and says, Hey, you need to ask for this guy named Peter. Everybody's sticking with me. Cornelius is told by God to send for Peter. So Cornelius does. He sends a couple of his servants to go fetch Peter. Peter, this is early in the book of Acts. Peter, he's over here in this other area. He gets up on a rooftop and he starts praying. And he asks God... But in his prayers, he's, he's speaking with God, and God sends down this blanket. Goes in, Paul, uh, Peter said he almost went into like a trance, and God sends down this blanket, and it's pulled on all four corners, and when it comes down, there's all the unclean animals. Now, we won't go over all those, but you could recognize like a pig, right? There's, there's unclean animals. There's, there's pork. And God says to Peter, rise up, kill it, and eat it. And Peter says, not so, Lord. No, 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 no. I've never eaten anything that was unclean. And what did God say to Peter? Don't call anything unclean that I've called clean. And guess what happens? A second time the blanket comes down and Peter says, No, not so, Lord. 
And God says, don't call anything clean, unclean that I've called clean. And a third time, Peter said in his own account in Acts chapter 10, Peter said this happened three times. He has this vision. He comes out of this trance, and guess who's knocking on the door? The two guys from Cornelius. And so Peter willingly goes with them. And let's pick up right there. It's Acts chapter 10 and verse 28. Look at Acts 10 and verse 28. And then he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company, to keep company with or to go to one of another nation. Did you see what he just said? Peter speaking to Cornelius says, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to, a man of a, or go to one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore, I came without objection as I was sent for, and I ask then for what reason have you sent for me? So Cornelius tells Peter his side. He said, well, I'm trying to learn about the Lord, and he told me to send for you. And so you know what Peter does to this Gentile? He shared the gospel with him. Peter told a Gentile, sat down and had a meal with him and shared the gospel with Cornelius. And guess what happened with Cornelius and the people that were around? They were saved. That was in Acts chapter 10. We are 20 years further than that in Galatians chapter 2. 20 years ago, Peter had a vision. The blanket came down. The animals were on it. He went to Cornelius' house. Cornelius and his household were saved. And Peter realized he had to have that wall broken down for him again. That there was no difference. There is no difference in, in the Jew or the Gentile when it comes to Christ. Is there a difference in the Jew and the Gentile in the Old Testament biblical way? Certainly, God chose the Jewish people. We're not taking that away from them. But what we are saying is that in Christ, there is no separation. There is no difference. There's not, just, there's not free and, and bond servant. There's not male and female. There's not Jew and Gentile. There's not barbarian and the other one that's hard to say, Scythian or whatever. There's not any of them. There is no division when it comes to Christ. We are all the same. And mind you, that is for you and I. When it comes to Christ, we have to come to Christ the same way that everyone else has to come to Christ. For forgiveness of our sins, because we have sinned against a holy God, and Christ is the only answer. He is the only way. Now, I need to be very clear about this before we leave here this morning. I need to be very clear that there is no other way. If there could be any other way, why then would God have sent His Son? That's what, go back to Galatians 2, and that's what Paul rounds this out with. Come to verse 19, so Galatians chapter 2 and verse 19. And look at what he says. For, though, for I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. In the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ died in vain. Do you see that last line? We're going to work our way backwards here. Do you see that last line? If righteousness could come by the law, if your salvation could come by obedience to some law, if God would say to you, let's use a few modern day ones, church ones, if God would say to you that you need to be baptized to be saved, then the question is, if baptism would save you, why did Christ die on the cross? Now, I love baptism. I want you to be baptized. You ought to be baptized. You believe in Jesus. You show the whole world you've been saved by being baptized. It's a step of obedience. You need to do that. But that will not save you. We don't, take, we don't take unsaved people into the water and dip them and bring them back up and now they're unsaved and we dip them and come up and now they're saved. It doesn't work that way. They're saved and so they go get in the water. Let me use one that's, 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 that's real, real easy to, to misconstrue. You do understand that church membership is not required. I love it when people join the church. We need to, you need to have church membership. If you'd like to talk about it, I'd love to talk about it with you. Church membership's important. We only got this building because we had membership. You do need to know that. The bank would have not done, we had to transfer it into our name. They wouldn't have transferred it if we didn't have membership. But you understand that membership will not save you. God did not say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and then join the local church and you get to be saved. No, it's believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and only in him. If there was anything else that we could put with salvation, why did Christ have to die? Now, you ready? Let's, let's get real hardcore. 
Let's get real hardcore because I don't know everybody in the building today. Let's, let's see who Brother Justin can make mad today. All right, here we go. You ready? There's a certain group of people trying to talk about purgatory. You understand what purgatory is, right? That's where you would go and have to pay for a few more of your sins. Right? You do realize that if you had to pay even one, even one drop of blood for any sin that you've ever committed, why did Jesus Christ have to shed his? Right? Do you understand that there is nothing with Christ? You can't rub beads, you can't light candles, you can't go to purgatory, you can't pay something, you can't say the right prayer. There is nothing that you can do to get rid of your sin. Christ paid for your sin, and all you have is faith in him. Anything else is trying to add to the gospel, and it makes the cross vanity. It would make it worthless. But I warn you this, you will not stand before God. You won't bow before God. You won't put your face on the ground before God and say, but I said that prayer. No. You won't cry before God and say, remember what God even said? He said, won't there be some that say, Lord, Lord, didn't I prophesy in your name? And didn't we, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do all this stuff in your name? And what will he say to them? Leave me, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. You want to know God? There's one way to know him, and it's through his son, Jesus Christ. I'm not skipping early. I know it's time, but I don't care. We're going to finish this. Look, look what he said. He said, if, 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 there was any, if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Go backwards with me. Look at what he says, because uh, this is a verse you need to hold on to. In verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. I, did you get that? I have been crucified with Christ. Stop. If you have been crucified, what does that mean? If somebody is crucified, nailed, hung on a cross, what did you say? You're dead. You don't come down off the cross. Nobody went up on a cross and came down. Paul said, I have been crucified. If he has been crucified, he, it means what? He's dead. I've been crucified with Christ. Read it. Nevertheless, I no longer live. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live. I live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God. I've been crucified with Christ, but I've been given a new life. There was a time my daughter, my youngest daughter, she was uh, just a few weeks old five weeks old and Sarah comes out I used to call it the dungeon it was my garage that I turned into a room and there was no windows in there and I would do my school work out there when I was in seminary and I was out there working and Sarah comes out and she's holding this limp baby who's laid back and she's all blue and Sarah goes she's not breathing and I jumped up and we ran out of the house and she's carrying this baby that was not breathing and, and we, we rushed her to the, to the uh, closest emergency room and they said, we don't work on kids. And I literally, I remember saying, I said, somebody help! So they grabbed oxygen and they started spraying oxygen on her face. They just opened the tube and were spraying oxygen on her face and her little body started going. <laughs> and she was breathing real fast like she was hiccuping over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And for the, they, they kept blowing that oxygen in her face and they put her in an ambulance. They drove her down to Cozair Children's and down to Cozair Children's Hospital. They, they had her in a room and they put the little tube on her little face and she was breathing <laughs> like this the whole time. For about 24 hours, she just kept breathing, looked like she was hiccuping the whole time. And they came to me and they said, Justin, we've got to put, her on, we've got to put a breathing tube in or her little body's going to give out. She won't keep doing that. She'll stop breathing. We've got to put a machine in her. And so they put this machine on her. It was the worst thing I'd ever seen. You, you have to watch your baby have a tube put down their throat and her little body would... <gasps> just like this. And she stayed on that thing for several days. And they kept coming in and they would remind me this. They would say, the only thing that is keeping her alive, the only thing that's keeping her going is that breathing machine. If we take it out right now, because I didn't want the thing in her. And they said, if we take that thing out right now, if we take that breathing machine out right now, she'll go right back to where she was. We want to make sure that she could breathe on her own. Right now, she can't breathe on her own. Listen to me. You can't save yourself. You can't live on your own. But you can die to Christ, and he'll be your life support. The life that I now live in the flesh, I don't live by myself. I've got something in me. 
It's not a breathing machine. It's the Holy Spirit of God. The life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave Himself for me. Christ has given Himself to you so that you can live. And if you think to yourself, look at me, I'm living in the flesh and I don't know Christ. Friend, don't you know you're a dead man walking? Do you not know that if you don't have faith in Jesus Christ, you might have blood pumping through your veins, but you are headed directly for hell, eternally separated from God, and God has said, I don't want that for you. I have sent my son for you. I'll give you life support, and the life that you now live, you can live by faith in the Son of God, who loved you and gave himself for you, and one day when you die, you will be with him for all of eternity. The eternity that I will one day live, I'm already in it, because I died with Christ, and now I live. Now, I need, to, I need to make sure that we understand something. I know, I told you, I know we're late, but it's okay. The last thing and I'm going to be done. You live in a world of confused identities. You live in a world of confused identities. Everybody's got their identities all mixed up. And you got people that think that they can say, well, I want to be a girl, and so they're a girl. Or girls say, I want to be a boy, so I'll be a boy. And people that say, I want to be younger, I want to be older, I want to be black, I want to be white. And they think they can just claim it, and then because they claimed it, they're that thing. Like you're seeing that right now with like, uh, especially transgenders and sports. You're seeing a lot of this happening. People saying, well, uh, a guy says, well, I claim I'm a girl. I'm a girl, so I'll, I'll be a girl today. And then they're like winning the track meets and the powerlifting and all these other things. What's the problem? What's the difference? Can I ask you a real, real serious question? What's the difference in a transgender saying, I'm not a boy anymore, now I'm a girl? What's the difference in that and a Christian saying, I'm no longer who I once was, I'm somebody new. Are you ready for this? Because I am not just claiming that I'm new. He made me new. You see, the difference is the world says, if I put it in my head, if I say it, if I claim it, then it's true. And God says, no, not if you claim it, it's true. If you have faith in the Son of God, He makes you new. You don't just get to claim new. You put your faith in Him and He makes you new. And then you'll be known by your fruits. That's the way that it goes. All right, we're going to close right there. I don't think there's a better way to close. Let's all stand up on our feet and I ask you this question. Have you been saved by faith in the Son of God? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you in Jesus' name to penetrate our hearts and work on us in this moment. And Father, I pray that there would be nothing that would keep us from you. We witness today as even Peter let his pride and his past get in the way. Father, I pray that we would not let anything keep us from you in this moment. Lord, if there is anything that we need to give to you, if there is anyone that is in this building or watching online who does not know you as their personal Savior, Father, I pray that you would get a hold of their hearts. I cannot do it. Father, I can hardly hold their attention. How could I ever reach their heart? But you can. I petition you as the holy God of this universe to reach down and fill this place with your Holy Spirit. And grab a hold of us, Lord, and if there's a decision that needs to be made, please, please, Father, draw that decision out and let it be made even today. I pray, Lord, that there would not be one person that would leave this building today unsure of who they are in you, unsure of where they would spend their eternity. Father, we just give you this time of invitation. Do with it your will. In Jesus' name, amen.